Great. Um, now we get to talk about economics. And uh, when I gave a lecture in our public health genetics course, the con student comment, my favorite comment, was it was nice to hear from the dark side. So uh, here we go. And uh, they, they often save uh, economics for last. And um, in some ways, I think it's because at the end of the day, ultimately, we all need to make decisions about whether things are a good value or not. So I want to tell you uh, a little bit about what's been happening in Caesar, but uh, try to focus a little bit more on what the uh, incredible opportunities are uh, in front of us uh, for future study. Um, first, I just want to talk a little bit ab about some terms here. Um, we talk about healthcare resource utilization. Uh, in some ways, that's code name for cost. It's really how much healthcare are people using, and we can put a price on that later and figure out what the costs are. But some of the main points, I think, are that just because something's expensive doesn't mean it's not good value. Just because it's cheap doesn't mean it's cost effective. And what we're really looking for in this field is to get the most health benefit that we can for the amount of money that we spend. Um, in the field, the technical field of health economics, we tend to measure outcomes uh, using this metric called a quality, quality adjusted life year. You can think of it as, as a year of perfect health. And it's a good thing. You want more qualities. Um, and we calculate something called an incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So you might hear me throw around, throw around some of those terms. Um, but of course, payers, they care a lot about costs. And that's something that we need to pay attention to. And that's why we're measuring this healthcare resource utilization in a lot of the studies within CSER. Um, ultimately, what we want to do is improve patient outcomes. And we want to do that in a cost-effective manner, which means the amount of money we're spending is reasonable compared to other, th other things that we buy in healthcare, or that we're cost savings. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's cost savings. So to sum it all up, when we talk about health economics, we're not just talking about cost. And in fact, uh, we're more, more often focusing on effectiveness. And so I'm really glad that the, the session on clinical utility preceded this one, because that really lays the foundation for cost utility. Now, these slides here just give you uh, kind of just a sense of what's going on in CSER uh, in some of the sites and the type of healthcare utilization data that are, that's being collected. And you can see that there's, you know, there's a lot of different things you can look at. Um, and there's a lot of different ways you can categorize uh, these outcomes. And um, it ranges everything from just number of uh, visits, what medications people are taking, uh, to questions about health insurance and maybe even life insurance. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of diversity across the different sites. And also, there's a lot of different ways, um, uh, methods for measuring this information. Uh, probably uh, in the CSER consortium, leaning a little bit toward uh, patient surveys to find out what kind of uh, resources are being used, um, but also some use of electronic medical records, uh, which can be quite powerful. So uh, ultimately, what is our goal here? It is to help healthcare systems and payers make more informed coverage and reimbursement decisions for clinical sequencing. And in order to do that, I think we've heard from uh, some of the, the questions and some of the speakers about challenges they've run into uh, with reimbursement in the Northwest, uh, uh, that uh, some decisions that affected us in Seattle were things such as any gene panel is investigational and therefore will not be covered. So and I think sometimes pairs are reacting to a lot of change and a lot of uncertainty, uh, sometimes strong marketing push from companies and are coming out with policies um, like that. And our goal here is really to help them make better decisions. Uh, and in order to do that, we're going to need to uh, collect some data. So first, I want to talk about just a few of the challenges and then the opportunities that I see for CSER II. The first one, and this is really a tough one, um, you know, people are always asking, what evidence do decision makers need? And then they'll invite PID the pairs, and pairs will say, well, we do like randomized controlled trials. And then everyone says, oh, they only want randomized controlled trials. Well, you know, none of that's true. It's a very, very hard question. It's very difficult to, to bring someone in and I think Naomi can attest this and say, what evidence do we need for whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing? Well, you know, I don't know. That's, that's a very broad question. You can start to ask more specific questions, but then you're asking that person to become an expert in that area. So it, it is an, an important challenge, and it's something that um, I'll come back to a bit, and I think uh, Pat will respond to also. 
I think the other issue really is that there's so many different things you can do with clinical sequencing um, that you know there isn't just some generic, well, is, is whole genome sequencing cost effective? Well, it depends. It's like, are drugs cost effective? Well, it depends. So you have to be very thoughtful about, well, what exactly are you talking about doing and what are you going to use it for and in who are you going to use it? Um, but that also presents the challenge that then there's lots of different things that you could be looking at. So that's, that, that's something we'll have to come to terms with. Um, and then also, obviously, I think we need information about all aspects of the delivery of the tests, um, not just the cost of the tests. And I know that um, in particular, two sites, Harvard and Kaiser, are collecting quant very carefully measured quantitative data about how much time is required by their uh, genetics providers. And then, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, the cancer sites are looking at the impact on treatment decisions. So these are the things that, um, that we'll need to put into the mix. I think another issue that really comes up and has been mentioned a couple of times is comparative data or comparative effectiveness. And it's something that I think uh, is really, it's quite important. Uh, it doesn't mean we always have to have it. it. doesn't mean we always have to have randomized controlled trials. Uh, but I think that um, to talk to payers, you really need to talk about comparative data. What's your next best uh, alternative and what's your opportunity cost? The last, lastly, I think we're all aware, um, you know, the sample size is really a key issue. Um, just in general, looking at health economics, costs, healthcare resource utilization for anything, is, it's very challenging. To, to collect enough uh, data in that area. And, you know, potentially you could quickly find yourself needing studies in the tens of thousands to even 100,000 people to get definitive health economics answers. And you know what, for the most part, that's not what we do in the field. Most of the time in the field, we take data from a randomized controlled trial that's powered for a clinical outcome, maybe a surrogate outcome, and then we do our best to estimate the economic outcomes. But this is an important challenge. So opportunities for uh, CSER moving forward, and I really think they're tremendous. The first one really, I think, is doing our best and figuring out ways to have conversations with payers and to get some input from people out there making decisions and, and, and enable them to tell us um, something about what it is we're doing uh, around the time that we're, we're trying to design and implement these studies and identify our outcomes. Um, it is very challenging. I think we need to be somewhat uh, indication specific, and it's important to talk about types of evidence rather than getting obsessed with what exact level of evidence is needed in order for you to say yes to this technology. That's just, it's, it's very hard to do, and um, it doesn't happen in other areas in healthcare. The other is that, um, you know, I think Katrina showed you that the heterogeneity of clinical indications and approaches across CSER, which I, th I agree has been a great strength because we've been able to learn a lot from that. But there's also kind of pools of similar indications or, or uses of clinical sequencing. And I think we need to f figure out how to, how to best align projects in those sub areas so that we can pool data uh, within those areas. Um, obviously, think, I think, you know, the three major categories would be diagnosis, treatment, and screening. And then particularly within screening, there's this subset of incidental findings. Um, uh, which could be viewed as opportunistic screening, and that's something that could apply across all sites. And we've already uh, started efforts uh, to do that. I think maybe tomorrow Jonathan Berg is going to be presenting some information about uh, the incidental findings across the entire CSER consortium. And then lastly, I really enjoyed um, um, the discussion about the families and, and getting involved with them. I think actually from a health economics perspective, I think what happens within families will be one of the single most important drivers for the value of precision medicine. And I think it's something we really need to give a lot of thought to. And then this, this other discussion about engagement with patients was great because think about engaging families. It's not easy either, right? You've got to figure out approaches to do that. Um, in terms of uh, data collection, I think that um, just briefly mentioning study design, again, trying to be comparative where feasible, trying to have uh, studies that are actually powered on some kind of outcome. Okay, we're not always going to power on survival, but we should have some kind of clinical outcome that these studies are powered to as feasible. I think we've seen a very nice, uh, you know, laid out, Robert laid out five trials that have been done and are ongoing right now, and those are all small, kind of phase one. I think it's time to think about moving to phase two in terms of in terms of the kinds of studies that we're doing, 
and, and, and moving, uh, you know, finding our initial signals and trying to confirm those and using a lot of the tools that we're developing here in this study, uh, in this consortium. And, and some of those tools um, really, I think, relate to data collection. I think, again, this, this patient and family-centered cost issue, um, the cost of, uh, you know, the, di the, the, the odyssey of trying to find a diagnosis for a patient, I don't think has been well doc enough. Uh, documentation has gone into that. I think that there also needs to be some communication with payers about what does that really mean and, uh, w you know, what's their level of engagement and willing to pay to end the diagnostic odyssey. We could probably make a more efficient use of EMRs uh, within CSER. I think that's something we need to think about. And then I think this last point, um, not to get too technical, but as I said, we're never going to have studies, <laughs> I think, that are powered for economic outcomes. I think we need to start thinking about developing patient-reported health economic outcomes where we can ask patients, what actions did you take because of your test result? Now, there's some obvious limitations with that, but I think that potentially we could develop some tools um, that would really enable us to find the signal and the noise there with the health healthcare resource utilization. And then lastly, I'll just mention uh, this general area of policy models. These are quantitative policy models, cost-effectiveness models. These are, com these are used throughout healthcare to try to get a better understanding of the boundaries of the benefits and harms uh, costs and ultimately the economic value of interventions. And, and even when you don't have a lot of data, they can be quite useful. And um, you know, one study by Carlos Gallego uh, was mentioned looking at uh, inherited colorectal cancer risk. These models, you know, there's been some work within CSER-1 to develop some of these models, but they're just sitting there kind of waiting for more data. And I think that not only further development of these models, but generating data in CSER-2 to inform those models and then having that uh, interaction and conversation with payers would be quite fruitful. So just in summary, I think there's, uh, for, the, for the consortium, I think there's some great opportunities. Uh, just to uh, go over, the, go over the, my key points again, payer and decision maker input, I think, will be uh, uh, really important but challenging. Um, developing, validating, and implementing some common economic measures across the consortium, and not just Caesar but also emerge and ignite, for instance. The, the working groups are starting to have conversations across those consortia, so I think there's great opportunity there. And then again, the data pooling um, within indications uh, and, and more broadly uh, as feasible. And then lastly, some of these uh, kind of policy frameworks to, to in a way fill the gaps where we're not going to be able to have these huge randomized trials for, for every indication. Uh, so that's it, and um, if we want to take questions or Allow Pat to respond. If there's one or two specific questions, and then we'll have the more general discussion. So, Dave, that was really nice. I was just wondering, um, do you have any thoughts about the prior discussion with regard to diagnosis? Uh, one obvious economic approach would be, you know, money saved by ending the diagnostic odyssey. But is that really the only way to address that? I, I think most of us as practitioners take it as almost axiomatic that making a diagnosis is a benefit. Um, you know, insurers don't pay much attention to what we consider to be axiomatic. Um, yeah, yeah, I think there's the, there's the, oh, we'll save money because we're not searching anymore, but that inherent value that it has to individuals, that's real. And there are methods that people have used and are actually are using within Caesar to put a monetary value on, on that for patients. The challenge is, Kind of, as a society, as a healthcare system, is that something we pay for or not? And I think there's some really nice work that could be done there that, you know, is, is, is a, bro a broader social issue even more than economic. Jim, just to build on that comment for a second, one of the um, corresponding struggles that has gone on for a long time is many people in the room probably come from academic medical centers. One of the challenges that academic medical centers have is in any way demonstrating that they have better quality than other centers. Because if you look at many of the kind of standard things, delivering mammograms to everyone, actually it doesn't necessarily look better. And so there's a corresponding effort going on now to try to ask the question, can we actually look at the quality that may come from a better diagnostic center than a, non, than a center that has less, uh, let's say, tools or ability to do that. So it'd be interesting to see if that can end up informing this discussion also, because it's kind of a corresponding 
effort, which really relates to why do people come and look for that diagnosis at a tertiary center. Okay, great. So then Patricia's going to give her comments, and then we'll have a general discussion. <laughs> 